Good morning to each one of you. We're happy to see you today and glad you have you with us. And if you happen to be a guest today, you honor us especially and we thank you for coming to be with us. We welcome also those who may join us online yet and the archives of the lessons that we have. We always want to say hello to you as well and welcome to our assembly and invite your questions at any time that there may be a, something that comes to mind. If you're a guest today, we'd love you to fill out one of those attendance cards and leave it for us so we'll have contact information. You may already have seen those picked up, but you can leave one on the pew or hand it to someone as you're exiting in order that we might have that. We encourage you to come back tonight. We're involved in a short series on Sunday nights about how do we survive in this world today. We all want to be survivors and eventually enter into the portals of heaven. We're talking about how can we be survivors. Join us tonight at 6 as we study that in our worship assembly. For today, there are some things that are just so very, very precious that you don't want to waste them whatsoever. I thought about trying to come up with some examples, but I thought everybody's got his own. But just think of those things sometimes in the case whenever the woman was going to use that ointment and anointing Jesus before his death. People were saying, this, this anointment, this, this, this could be used for something else. It's, it's too precious. There was a woman who had lost the one of the ten coins that she had, and she was so very, very interested in finding that one because it meant so much to her to have them all because of the circumstances. There was the son that was lost. There was the pearl of great price. There are things that we think about that mean so much to us. But there's one thing that means more than anything else in the kingdom. One thing that means more than anything else in terms of the communication that God gives for us. And it's called the word of God. As Tim has read for us this morning from Isaiah chapter 55. The Isaiah quotes from the Lord. Speaking of the fact that his word will not return to him void, that we are to spread it and share it, and it's always going to have impact. Every word of it is so very, very precious. None of it should ever be wasted. It should never be treated as though it was common because it's so precious. Think about the fact that there's no other way on earth that man can learn about God except through the word. He doesn't learn about him in science. He doesn't learn about him in history whenever it's disassociated from the word of God. But the story that God communicates is about someone. The someone who would come. The someone who came. The someone who's coming again. Jesus. And that's all in the word. And the instructions that we give about how to live. All things that pertain unto life and godliness, the New Testament says, are given to us. But that's provided through the word of God. What if it's wasted? What if it's lost? What if it's treated in any way other than with the greatest amount of respect? We need to understand what that means. There's a situation that I want us to go to for a beginning this morning in 1 Samuel. You know that story and the account that Hannah, who would be the mother of Samuel, was childless and she asked God for a son. She didn't just ask for a child, she asked for a son. There were many reasons for that, and we'll not go into those, but she was given the answer to her prayer. But she had promised, if I have a son, I'll dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. When Samuel was born, she was immediately reminded of that, and she kept her promise. She didn't even go up to the temple in the coming year because she stayed behind with that boy. She was taking the best of care of him. But then after he was weaned, she took him to the temple and she left him with Eli. And he served in that capacity for some time. You remember also that one night whenever he was sleeping, he heard the voice of the Lord, but he didn't recognize it. He thought that it was Eli calling him and he went to Eli's bed and Eli said, I didn't call you. It was the third time before Eli finally said, if you hear that again, answer, here am I, your servant hears. And on that occasion, when Samuel heard the voice of God, he said, here am I, thy servant heareth. 
And God told him things are about to change. In fact, he said, I'm about to do something in the kingdom that will be such that when everybody hears it, when anybody hears it, his spine will tingle. And what was about to happen was that Eli would be deposed and that Samuel would become the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. He grew up continuing to serve in the temple. And finally, whenever the transition has occurred, and there is the announcement that I think is so very, very interesting in the end part of the third chapter of 1 Samuel. We're told that in verse 19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and he let none of his words fall to the ground. Not a word was wasted. Whenever Samuel preached, it never fell. It never was lost. The word of the Lord never returned, not having accomplished something, as Isaiah said, that it would not. And he treated it preciously, and the people received it, and great and wonderful things would happen because not a word of the Lord had fallen to the ground. Whenever we study the word, we find that there is a consistency in that. We see the providence of God working through the word, touching lives, changing people, and we find in every case, God, whenever he has promised something, has always kept the promise. Not only are we to respect the word of God so that we never let a word of it fall to the ground or be wasted, but God looks at it that way also. God keeps his word entirely. It's illustrated by what we've experienced. It's illustrated by what we read in the scriptures. It's illustrated in the scriptures itself in passages like Psalms 136 that in every verse is concluding with saying that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. The Lord is entirely and completely dependable in every way. He does not let one of the things that he's promised us not occur. He does not let one of the commandments that he's given be something that is unnecessary or it's okay for us to disregard. Whenever the Hebrew writer was starting to discuss Jesus, he said if every, under the old system, early part of chapter 2, if every commandment and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken to us by the Lord, has now been confirmed to us by those that heard him, and the Lord God himself also bearing witness by the signs and wonders that they did. He's saying this is to be taken seriously and each and every commandment is to be obeyed. And each and every time that a commandment is disobeyed, he said there is the due recompense. That is, if you disobey, there are certain punishment that occurs because of it and God is consistently keeping his part of the deal all of the time. Not a word falls to the ground in our attitude, in our disposition, in our relationship to the Lord, in our listening to sermons or reading the scriptures, it becomes necessary for us to understand this is not some common book. This is not some common message. This is not something I should take lightly. This is not a joking affair. This is not an affair that deals with the possibility of I may or I may not. And I'm at liberty to make up my own mind and make my own decisions because when that occurs, the power that's in the word and the will of God becomes wasted. Oh, there are so many things in the scriptures. If I would start to try to say, now this is important, where would I begin and where would I end? Those eternal principles that are scattered throughout the pages of God's word are ones that we need always to define. Sometimes we kind of skip over them without realizing the, the real message and impact they would be in our own lives. Proverbs, we started a study of Proverbs in the auditorium this morning. In chapter 13 and verse 15, there's a statement that, that kind of passes by as though it had little significance to us whenever the Lord said, the way of the transgressor is hard. 
the way of the transgressor is hard. Young people, there is a vital lesson in that. Don't let a word of it fall to the ground. Don't miss that. Because in our lives, we have the choice that we may obey the Lord or we may disobey. We may live lives that are characterized by righteousness or we may choose to enter into a life full of sin. But the Lord is saying, if you make that second choice, if you decide that you're going to let your life be characterized by that business of transgressing and disobeying the word and the will of the Lord, he said your life will be always less than it could have been. The way of the transgressor is hard. There's an expression we sometimes use, and I'm not sure that it's always kind, but it brings to mind something that, that we understand. Sometimes we speak of someone whose life has been rough as, as being like 40 miles of bad road. Almost always when you see people who have just lived life in a worldly way, when they have been disassociated with the Lord and, and living in the footsteps of Jesus, they've had hard, hard times. And you can see it in their face. And if you hear their life story, it's full of turmoil and distress. It's quite often dysfunction and almost irreparable kinds of damage that have occurred to the psyche. And we feel sorry for them and we should, but it comes as a result of being transgressors. The scripture teach that if we will walk in the footsteps of Jesus, our life will be better. Now, I hasten to say that the scriptures do not say that if you do the right thing, there will never be any trials. The Lord does not say that there's a pie in the sky kind of religion where if we just always are doing the will of God, Satan will never try us. He'll never try to pull us away. He will, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Indeed, he will, but there's a basic rule that's inherent in the commandment that the Lord gives to young people whenever he said, Obey your parents, that your days upon the earth may be long, that it may be well with you, and your days upon the earth may be long. Whenever young people decide, I'm going to follow the principles that my parents taught me. I'm going to do the things that God teaches in the Word. I'm going to give, live a good life. I'm going to avoid sin as much as I possibly can. They have, therefore, chosen the better life for themselves. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He's not just speaking about eternity, but he's speaking about this life. And the principle is that if we will walk in his footsteps, we're going to find life to be much more harmonious. There'll be more peace in our lives. Paul said, as much as, as in you is, then live at peace with all men. And the people who are trying to live that way enjoy much less stress and they have much more to hope for and to look forward to. That, that statement, the way of the transgressor is hard, needs to be seriously taken. Don't let it fall to the ground. I think of the principle that the Apostle Paul spoke of in Galatians chapter 6 whenever he talked about the responsibilities we have. I think of his saying that, that the man cannot fool God chapter 1 he said it, you, you cannot do that you, you have no way if you think you're deceiving the Lord he says you, you're, you're wrong it is impossible to do that and we have to understand today that God is not mocked he certainly is not we live in a time whenever so many people think God's off there somewhere beyond the blue and He's separated, and he's unconscious of all that's going on with us. And we can plan our own route, and we can do our own thing, even in worship or in the church. We can choose as we want to, and we don't have to regard what the Word of God says about it. And we let so much fall to the ground in terms of what the Lord wants. But God is not mocked. As a man soweth, so shall he reap. 
You see, they that sow, he said, to the flesh, while of the flesh reap everlasting destruction, while the ones who sow to the Spirit will reap everlasting life. We make the choice. But to try to say, I'll set my own pattern, I'll do it my way. I don't have to do everything that God said because a lot of people don't. I have friends that don't, and so I don't have to, and I can do what they do, and it doesn't matter what God says. Oh, forbid that we would let the word fall to the ground that way and regard it as though we're, it's not serious to us. It is an eternal principle that you cannot play games with God. He is eternally conscious of everything that happens in our lives. Jesus said he knows even the things that are in our heart. The wise man said whenever judgment occurs that everything that will, has happened will occur, even the secret things will be brought into judgment. You don't play with God who is all powerful, the man who is always the one who has separated man from, from all other creatures the one who created this all in a plan to send Jesus and provided a way of salvation through the blood of Jesus that is just so remarkably clear in the word, whenever we think that's unimportant and we can still go to heaven, we've let something drop. We miss some very, very important principles that are in the word whenever we start to try to set our own course without regard for what the Lord has given speaking of given how about that passage in Luke chapter 6 verse 38 give and it'll be given to you good measure heaped up pressed down shaken together will men give into your bosom give the whole principle the idea here is is that we live a life that is full of giving almost always I think in today's situation if the preacher or someone from the pulpit speaks of giving, our mind immediately goes to the Sunday morning contribution that we make every Lord's Day. But that's not the only way that we give, and that's not the only gift. For our life becomes, first, a gift to us from the Lord, but then in return, it ought to be a gift back to the Lord. As Hannah gave Samuel back to the Lord, we also ought to give ourselves and even our children back to the Lord. Give, and it will be given to you. It's more than Sunday morning. It's a matter of attitude and of life, of being generous, of being kind, of sacrificing for the sake of someone else and some other cause, putting something first, putting something before myself, putting the local church before my own pleasures and entertainment and all of that, putting my family before my own wishes and putting the kingdom as more important to us while we live upon this earth than any material blessings, than any amount we might accumulate, any possessions we might have, any prominence we might achieve, any special kinds of awards that we might have heaped upon us. None of that compares at all with the principle of being someone who generously gives of himself in order that other people may be blessed. Don't let that word fall to the ground because to be selfish, self-centered, to be people who hold on to everything and look out just for number one like the philosophy of the world says, misses, it drops that word. It lets it fall to the ground and becomes wasted when it was something that was intended by the Lord God Almighty to be generously salved upon our lives and, and to be just massaged into it that we understand that giving is sweet and it's good and it is part of that business of the peace that we seek because it is more blessed to give than to receive. We've missed that. It's dropped. It's lost. And in a materialistic world, we seek to achieve and accomplish things for ourselves so often when we need to be surrendering. That reminds me of a passage also in the Proverbs in the 18th chapter, verses 24. The scripture says, if a man would have friends, he must first show himself friendly. If we want to be a person who 
enjoys life. How can you enjoy life without the association, the fellowship, the social contact and connection with other fellow human beings? And those, are, those become friends. And we love to have friends because it makes us feel good. They become our support system and they build us up and they help us through. But the Lord said if a man's going to have that kind of support system, he's got to first be a friend. He has to help somebody else. He has to be willing to set aside whatever might be the, the thing that, that he wants or wishes if it would interfere with somebody else being made to feel good or be assisted. He says surrender that in order that you can supply the other person. What a message there is in that. And you see sometimes people that you seem like, you say, well, it seems like everybody knows them. I like it whenever I can say of somebody that I think everybody who ever knew them loves them. The reason they do is because they, the individual who's loved, has shown love to other people and is simply being reflected, is simply being appreciated. And we are to be that kind of people. When we miss that point, Something that God intended to be enjoyed in our life for ourselves, but also this to be a supporting factor to help other people do right, be right, and enjoy their life. That's missing, and it's dropped. If we should suddenly, in this country, take away the effect of all the preaching that is occurring even this morning from all the pulpits in this land our culture would treat would just absolutely crater and you say well you know we're we're we got some problems in this country we've got some moral issues we got some things that are wrong there are, I don't have anything in mind because I know nothing right now, but, but you, you would be safe to say there are some things last night that happened somewhere that hurt a lot of people and it's just bad and people uh, hurt other folks and yes, yes. There's wickedness and there's sin, there's evil in the world. But there are pulpits across this country and I include pulpits that are not in the churches of Christ where people may in fact be teaching some wrong things about the plan of salvation and about the church and about baptism, maybe they are, but when they deal with moral principles, when they more deal with family and justice and those things, they are on target. When they're teaching morality, to young people and to families. When they're teaching love and they're teaching grace and people are assimilating it, the culture of this country is being altered for good. But if you suddenly should just like a vacuum suck all that out, can you imagine what our culture would be like? Because you see all the words of God would be falling to the ground and it would all be gone. The power that's in the word of God to affect change and good and morality, to affect kindness and love and generosity, to affect ethics and the way people treat each other and brotherhood cannot be measured. But what we are lacking is not enough people are hearing it. And what we're lacking is not enough people are stressing it. And what we're lacking is that not enough people are honoring it. Not enough people are taking it seriously. Not enough people are understanding that I'm not in charge. Man's not in charge. God is in charge. And we must put him first. Remember Acts 4.12. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
referring to Jesus. That obedience to him is essential. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, speaking even of Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. That is lost in our world today. People are given choice, but obey is an ugly word to them. Submission is an ugly word to them. And the idea of submission is so consistent with everything that's involved in God's plan for our lives that it cannot be separated. The fact that the church belongs to God, it's his family. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, these things I write to you hoping to come to you soon. But if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of God, the pillar and the ground of the truth, Folks mess with God's church. People divide, they split, they hurt, they harm. They damage God's church, his family in lots of places. How on earth do they let that word fall to the ground? This is God's family, God's family. Folks, you don't mess with God's family. But when people take it so lightly as to think, I want my way, and if I don't get my way, I'll tear up the whole thing. Oh, so much has fallen to the ground of what really is important. Oh, bless Samuel. Not a word that he said fell to the ground. And finally, the essentiality of God's plan of salvation. We find it in the word. We don't find it in television sermons. We don't find it in the devices of the denominational doctrines. We find it in the word. And people go through almost as though they're erasing some of the things that God said we must do to be saved. And they're changing, and they're saying, that's not necessary, that's not necessary. God forbid that his word would be treated so lightly that it would be handled so cheaply. There will be judgment. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 14, God said, I have said it, and I will do it. You can take that to the bank. When God said it, he will do it. Part of what he said is these are the things I want you to do. And he promised that he would reward us tremendously if we will, but that there will be certain condemnation for those who defy him let his word fall to the earth and disobey look at your heart this morning look at your soul look at your attitude your mind your style of life and the question am i letting the word fall to the ground if you're somebody who's playing church you've missed something if you're playing games with god you miss something you missed the point, the principle. If you're somebody who knows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you believe that perhaps, but you've never been willing to confess your sins to the Lord. Maybe you've never been willing to confess the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never been willing to repent of sin, and you've never been willing to submit to baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Think what you're wasting in a word, you're wasting blood, the blood of Jesus has fallen to the ground in every sense. If it poured out on Calvary and you don't avail the opportunity for salvation that it provides. If today you're subject to the invitation of the Lord, don't waste it. Come right now while we stand and sing.